Thank you all for coming to the LPI virtual seminar this week. Our guest this week is a, a Dr. Mark Panning. Uh, Mark is, got his PhD from the, in geophysics from the University of California, Berkeley, and is uh, currently at, has been at JPL since 2017. He is the project scientist and co-investigator on the InSight mission to Mars, and also a co-investigator on the Dragonfly mission to Titan currently in development. Um, and his talk uh, this week is on uh, planetary seismology, uh, looking at three years on Mars and uh, looking for it to a return to the moon. Um, just as a uh, reminder, during the talk, please leave your microphones muted and your cameras off. If you have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat during the talk and we will address them either, uh, Mark can either address them in the moment or we'll uh, go over them in the last 15 minutes of the talk. With that, uh, Thank you so much for coming today, Mark. Uh, please take it away. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I, the, the talk today, I'm gonna, it's gonna exist in two parts. First, I'm gonna talk about um, our results from InSight uh, on Mars. And then uh, the last third of the talk or so, well, I'll talk a little bit about uh, um, plans to go back to the moon, to the far side of the moon um, with uh, some of the instruments from InSight. And, uh, I have an initial author list on here. This is kind of my standard author list for some of the, the insight stuff I'm talking about, but it, it is by no means exhaustive. Um, in fact, a more exhaustive list might look like this. This is the, um, as of probably about a year ago, the official full science team for insight. Um, I, I don't need to talk too much to this audience uh, about that, about this, but one of the things that was most fascinating to me when I moved from terrestrial science to planetary science is that my author list became much longer because it really takes a village to make a, a mission go. Um, but just to orient you to what we're doing with InSight, I, I'm sure some of you are quite familiar with the mission, but uh, others may not be. So I just kind of wanted to talk through, you know, what, what, we're, what we've been trying to do on Mars. And um, the key here is that uh, this is really only the third planetary interior that we've been able to do in a high level of detail. Everybody has seen lots of cartoons of what the insides of all the planets look like, but uh, those are uh, primarily um, nearly fictional based on, on gravity data, which has large uncertainties and, and all of the size. The real good way to get down and understand how big's the core, how thick the crust is, all of these sorts of questions is through seismology. And of course, we've been doing that on the Earth since right around the beginning of the 20th century, um, to the point that by we hit the middle of the 20th century, we were had very much converged on what the 1D structure of the Earth looked like to a high level of precision. Um, uh, and then, of course, with the Apollo missions in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, we were able to do much of the same thing on the moon. Full geophysical uh, uh, packages landed with the Apollo missions and the seismometers stayed uh, running until 1977, about two months after I was born. And I've spent the rest of my life waiting for more uh, uh, planetary seismic data. And uh, we now have it from Mars and we'll hopefully soon be having more from the moon. Um, and so, you know, by combining our new understanding of Mars with the existing understanding of Earth and the moon, it's really the, the overarching goal is to get at um, the, the, the formation and evolution processes of terrestrial planets, which uh, I lump all of these uh, uh, bodies into. Um, we have three main science instruments on, on InSight. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about size, which is the seismometer uh, package, which includes both uh, a very broadband, very sensitive seismometer and a short period less sensitive seismometer, um, but with more sensitivity to some higher frequencies. Um, but we also have a radio science experiment that uses the medium gain uh, antennas um, with direct earth communication. And finally, we have the heat flow and physical properties package, HP cubed, um, which consists of a radiometer, which you don't see, it's actually on the backside of the lander. And um, the, the, the heat flow probe, which was designed to reach three to five meters depth, we'll talk more about what actually happened uh, later in the talk. But uh, those are our three major instruments, but there's a whole lot of supporting instruments that go in 
to, to using those, those major instruments. Um, we have cameras on uh, underneath the deck that show the, the deployment area uh, and on the arm so we can get closer look. The arm contains a scoop even, which was originally um, thought to be superfluous, but was kept as a, well, it's already on the arm because this is descended from from Phoenix, um, but it ends up we've gotten quite a bit of use out of that scoop. Um, and then we have a full meteorological suite because it turns out seismometers are very sensitive to everything. Um, uh, and so we have wind and pressure sensors, a magnetometer, all of these things are there to support the main uh, instruments, but are also able to do science of their own. Um, we are uh, been happily staying in exactly the same place uh, since landing in 2018. Um, that's uh, this little dot right here inside uh, a, a little bit north of Gale Crater where Curiosity is um, along the Elysium Planitia here. Um, uh, in order to figure out where to land, we needed to be close to the equator because we wanted to go run year round on solar panels. Um, and, uh, you know, there are all other constraints about elevation and all of that. And so this ended up being about the only place we could land that met all of the needs for landing. Um, here's some orbital images of the area. There's some craters not too far away, but it's relatively small craters around us um, and uh, you there are geologists on our mission so all all of the rocks have gotten names um, there's I, I could show more of those but uh, that's that's what's going on this was one of the early images I, I always show this not you know uh, it's probably not surprising to to this crowd but it it really is fascinating to me to see spacecraft taking picture of other spacecraft um, so this is uh, our view from high rise. Um, this was fairly soon after we finished deploying on the surface. So um, the landers right here in the middle, solar panels are the Mickey Mouse ears on the side. And the bright pixel right there is actually the seismometer out on the surface. Um, and you can see also the, uh, uh, the, the lightening and darkening associated with our landing process um, that happened. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about the other instruments besides size. The radio science experiment um, is looking at basically very precise determinations of the spin axis um, and uh, comparing it with uh, other precise measurements um, going back to Viking um, and then also including Pathfinder and, and minimal data from the rovers. They're not as good because they keep moving um, for these things. We want to stay still. Um, and uh, these are aiming to look primarily at core properties. This is aiming primarily, primarily to look at core properties. And basically the way this works is during the, the radio communications, you do uh, Doppler uh, measurements to get very uh, precise estimates of, of velocity and, and position. Um, and uh, this gives us actually insight is probably the most well located spot on Mars in inertial space because of this. Um, and uh, once again, uh, the, these, these estimates do confirm uh, a liquid core. Um, uh, which I'll get back to from the seismic perspective later. Um, and uh, initial measurements suggest that, that you know, this gives a, a, a range between 1,800 and 2,000 kilometers, more or less, which is actually quite consistent with what we get from the seismic estimates, which once again, I'm going to discuss later. Um, we do have a magnetometer on board, which has made some interesting observations. Probably the most interesting one to me um, is that uh, the, the, the constant field due to crustal magnetization um, is about an order of magnitude higher than what can be measured from orbit. Um, that doesn't, uh, that of course doesn't mean that orbital measurements are wrong. It means that the, 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 the crustal magnetization is varying strongly on scales less than 150 kilometers, which will not be measurable from orbit. So this is giving us more information on how the crustal magnetization varies on short wavelengths. Um, and there's a lot of look at, at time varying fields um, and, and trying to use that to look both at processes and um, uh, related to um, uh, the solar driving forces of these variations and also trying to use those to look look for uh, magnetic sounding of the interior um, and most of that much of that work is ongoing. Um, I'm only showing the first few hundred souls of, uh, uh, of data from the meteorology just because I haven't updated the slide and I apologize for that but um, uh, there, we have um, some 
really great data. We're not getting as much lately because energy means we haven't been able to have it on as much, uh, but uh, we've seen lots of really repeatable patterns uh, uh, through the system and, and uh, seen lots of interesting waves uh, and um, an almost uncountable number, number of pressure drops related to vortices. Uh, unfortunately, none of which have led to dust devils that cleaned off our panels, but there are, certainly are uh, lots of vortices that, that go through the area um, and some hints of infrasound signals. Um, jumping into my bread and butter, the seismometer, um, in order to have uh, to make measurements on Mars, we knew it was going to be quiet. Um, there's no plate tectonics on Mars, nobody's arguing for that, and so we knew that there were going to be much fewer quakes than are seen on the Earth, and so we needed a very sensitive seismometer to see global quakes. Um, and so our target was in the range of nanometers per second squared um, and, and, and acceleration, and if you convert that to displacement at, at our frequencies that we're interested in, those displacements are smaller than a hydrogen atom. So, you know, on a, on a, uh, an, uh, um, image of a hydrogen atom here. We're, lo we're looking at uh, uh, our target sensitivity as this black line. Um, actually, what we managed to do, we have exceeded expectations. Our, our lowest noise floor is more like the black dot there in the middle. Um, but in order to get that level of sensitivity, there's a lot of work that had to go in to uh, compensate for all the different noise sources that weren't the, from, from quakes. Um, so we had to get a very quiet intrinsic uh, instrument noise and we had to minimize temperature variations, wind, atmospheric pressure, magnetic field. And we had to do a lot of understanding of lander vibrations. Um, so in November, 2018, we landed on the surface and this was one of the first selfies um, that, the, that the spacecraft took. And I, I look back on this picture and I look at how beautifully undusty those solar panels are and it's just amazing. Um, uh, but so size is right here in the middle, the kind of coppery or uh, goldy colored thing there in the middle. Um, and, uh, and it's uh, sitting on the deck and that's now at that point that we were as close to Mars as the Viking landers ever got with their seismometers. So both the Viking landers one and two included seismometers. One of them didn't work. I believe it was Viking one did not work at all. It didn't uncage. The Viking two seismometer did uncage, but because it's sitting here on the deck of the lander, um, it did a very good job of measuring the wind impact on the lander, but did not make any convincing um, uh, measurements of internal internal generated noise like quakes. Um, so in order to get around that problem and not have the same issue happen to us as Viking, we uh, had an arm and we deployed to the surface. Um, and so um, the video on the right here is going to show the whole process more or less from the, the view of our instrument context camera under the deck. And so we put it out on the surface about a meter out. Um, eventually, we're going to let the, the, the tether uh, come down, which so it's not blowing in the wind. There, that happened. Um, and then there's a lot of work that goes on here where we try to release this little service loop right here, which is supposed to decouple the instrument from uh, thermal noise on the tether. And this took us quite a while. We had several tries where we were trying to pull open that little gap. You can see it there. We finally did it. 60 souls in um, and then and, and then finished it up. Um, and then here next, we're gonna bring out the, the wind and thermal shield, which protects us from uh, winds blowing on and, and decreases thermal noise. Um, and at soul 70, we actually release and we have a fully functional seismometer that's able to produce the noise level we need. Um, and so uh, if you were a field seismologist on earth, installing a very high quality station may take you a few hours. Um, on Mars because of the, the difficulties of doing things in space where you have to send a command, wait for the pictures to come out, recalculate what you should do for the next one, send a new command, everything that takes minutes on Earth takes days. Um, and so, uh, so two and a half months later, we've got a very good seismometer. Um, yeah, moving on here, uh, this is just a few images zooming in on some of those activities. I'm not gonna talk about those too much. Um, one of the first questions that always came up when we were first proposing this mission and trying to convince people to, that, that this was a great way to do science on Mars um, uh, is that we are talking about a single station um, and everybody probably took a, a class somewhere where they learned that in order to locate events, you need to triangulate from three stations. Um, and the short 
version of that is that's totally not true. If we look at uh, a, a good seismic arrival, we can look for P and S waves and the timing between them set, sets distance. So say we are 155 seconds, that tells us the, what the distance should be based on various seismic models. And so we know how far away the event is. And if we can make measurements of the polarization of those seismic signals, how they're, how they're vibrating uh, directionally speaking, we can actually look at what direction the seismic waves came from. So if you have a distance in a direction, you have a location. Um, and so we are able to do that for many events, not all of the events. Um, here's a picture of pretty much all the events. This is actually through Sol 1008. Um, this was just before we stopped getting data for a conjunction. Um, I think we actually got through Sol 1012 or so um, before we uh, hit the point where we're basically getting no more data until uh, the end of the month uh, when we come out of conjunction. Um, but uh, this is basically all the data here. The colors on here, each line going across is actually a spectrogram of the data for the full day. Um, you can't see all the details here, but the color scale tells you when the noise level is high are these warm colors, and when it's very quiet are the, the purpley colors, and every symbol on here are different kinds of events. Um, I I, I didn't update that. I, this was Sol 1008. We got a few more events since then, but through Sol 1008, we had 938 events. Um, most of these are, are high frequency events, which are, um, are ones that I don't totally understand, but the low frequency ones um, are, are the, the, the bigger signals on here. And these are ones that look, that we've been using for a lot of our uh, work at looking at the interior structure of Mars. Um, and uh, you can see we have a nice repeatable pattern and during the non dust storm seasons we get these really great evening time periods where we get lots of uh, quakes measured. And then as we went through the dust storm season we saw very few events because it was noisy all day and then we came out of the dust storm season and now we're getting all lots of events again. Um, just to talk about how it looks when we try to find these events. These are uh, some of the first handful of uh, events that we found um, uh, in the first 200 souls of the mission. Um, and uh, I, for people who aren't used to looking at this, uh, the patterns we're seeing here, the bright parts here are the, the noisy parts during the day, the purpley parts are the quiet parts um, during uh, evenings. Um, and actually the events here are pretty hard to see. I'll tell you that there's a few of them floating around here, but they're easier to see if I highlight them. Uh, they're, they're pretty subtle signals. Um, and so it's, there's a lot of art and we spend a lot of time going, we have a, lot, a large team in the Mars Quake Service that's always looking for these every time the data comes down. Um, the first large event we saw was on Sol 173. Um, about a magnitude 3.7 um, and it has nice clear P and S arrivals that can be picked out. There's also this giant signal right here which is nothing to do with the interior of Mars. It's what we call a glitch and we see these all through our data. Um, this is because even after we did all these controls there's still some pretty broad temperature changes that happen along the sensing chain of the instrument and those produce thermal cracks and pops and so we still have glitches in the data that we have to uh, account for. Um, for the next three slides, I'm going to summarize uh, some of the, the basically the all of the level one science goals, the things we wanted to get done uh, looking at the interior from seismology um, in particular, um, were all published uh, over the summer and in, 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 uh, a single issue of science, which is real exciting. Um, and basically, we looked at the structure of the crust, mantle, and core. Um, and uh, so first, the crust, um, this is a uh, paper led by Brigitte Natmeyer engine. And, um, and this, so basically, if we just pick out PNS waves, we can tell you where the event is, but we can't use it to figure out anything about the interior because we have just enough information to say how far away it is and, and, and um, what time it happened. We don't have enough information to say, well, how long did it take for things to propagate through the interior um, and therefore get at structure. So we have to look for smaller signals after the PNS waves. In the case of the crust, we looked at these things called receiver functions, which are after the uh, initial arrival of the P wave, you do some creative processing to pull out things that look like S waves arriving just after the P wave. And what these are are related to conversions of P energy to S energy at interfaces below the station. 
And so um, across uh, our three clearest events, 183A, 173A, and 235B, we, um, and, and a few events since this study was initially done, we see three clear arrivals that repeat. Um, there's lots of lines on here. There's a lot of different processing and deglitching approaches that are used. So we, um, you know, we basically tested every range of things you could do to the data to make sure we were picking up the consistent features that were not dependent on a particular processing method. And there's three arrivals, and this could be interpreted as a three-layer crust, conversions at each of those layers. Or unfortunately, we couldn't exclude a two-layer crust with just an extra bounce in the top. Um, those produce very similar uh, features in the, the, the records we're looking at here. Um, but uh, they suggest at Insight, we have a crustal thickness of uh, 20 or 40 kilometers. And if you extrapolate that out using gravity to the, the global structure by comparing gravity and topography, you can constrain global variation of crustal thickness, but not absolute thickness very well um, by adding this result to that result then we can say that the um, overall crustal average crustal thickness of mars is in the 36 to 72 kilometer range um, so uh, that is not unexpected pre-mission but it excludes a lot of the very thick crust models that rely on having a very dense crust um, it implies the crust is um, towards the thinner less dense end of the the pre-mission expectations um, for the mantle structure, we had to look for additional waves called PP, PPPSS waves. These are basically waves that bounce off the surface of the planet before they arrive at the station. So they come from the event and then bounce off the surface a few times um, and are compared with the direct paths uh, shown here. Um, and uh, these are, are were fairly subtle features, but could be pulled out. And um, the, the ta key takeaway from the mantle velocity modeling is that uh, in order to match this data, you actually need a fairly extensive region where the velocity is decreasing um, over the top 400 to 600 kilometers. Um, this is consistent with a thick lithosphere um, where we have conductive temperature gradients, in which case the, the increase in temperature, which decreases science, uh, seismic velocity, outpaces the um, increase in seismic velocity associated with increasing pressure as you go down. So, um, uh, and this, so this sets constraints on how thick a lithosphere we have, and then also gives us some uh, constraints on the overall mantle temperature, which um, appears to be on the cool end of pre-mission expectations. Um, and finally, the, the last paper in this, this suite was looking at the core, and this involved pulling out um, uh, additional phases that bounced off the core mantle boundary, in this case, SCS. Um, in raw data, this SCS is really hard to see um, to the point that we wouldn't pick this wiggle as being any more significant than any of the wiggles around it. Um, but by um, doing some very careful filtering for looking at energy that's just coming in at, with the right polarization to match what SCS is, there's actually a fairly clear arrival here for Sol, the um, Sol 173 event, and we are able to see this in uh, five other events as well, all showing a consistent arrival time consistent with a core radius of 1830 kilometers, which, um, I, as I pointed out earlier, is consistent with the estimates we were getting for RISE. This is towards the upper end of pre-mission expectations, which also, when you combine it with gravity data, implies that the core is actually fairly light, uh, not very dense. Um, uh, so so light, in fact, that in order to just do it with sulfur, which is something that's commonly done in models, you have to have probably over 20% sulfur, which is probably not realistic. So there's probably other light elements in the, the, the Martian core as well. Um, we are able to locate some events. I'm just showing the, the, the three early events that were best located. This is published by uh, Giardini et al. in 2020. Um, and the two most well-located events were 173A and 235B, which both fell in this region called Cerberus Fossi. Um, this is an area with young lava flows that have happened in the last few million years. Um, uh, they're very clear, sharp-sided, uh, um, uh, basically grobbin that, that can be seen um, that also show fresh rock falls. So this was an area before the mission that we expected we might see seismicity because those rock falls were interpreted as signs of shaking. 
Um, and it turns out that actually all of our best located events happen right there. So this is one of those things where the remote observations um, made suggestions that our in situ observations of, of Mars quakes confirmed. And that's, that's actually really exciting. Um, if we, uh, we can even try to look at, uh, by looking at the waveforms, what kind of uh, fault motions are associated with this. And if you're not used to work looking at these beach ball diagrams or what fault motions look like, don't worry about it. Um, the point is that these uh, uh, fault motions that we're imaging actually show pretty consistent orientation. The fault's oriented similar to what the fractures are. And the type of motion is what's called a normal fault, which is what we expect in extensional settings, which is what these graben look like. So this is um, a uh, pretty exciting uh, combination of our in situ observations and the remote observations. Um, talking about the, uh, the heat flow probe, um, this got a lot of attention at, uh, at various points in the mission and was um, a, a pretty, uh, something I really wanted to see data from because, you know, when we make all these models of what the mantle temperature is and the crustal thickness is, that starts making predictions of how much heat, how much heat producing elements should be in the crust. And there's a lot of interesting implications in that. One thing we'd like to do to constrain that would be to look at heat flow. Um, and so in order to do that, this was a, uh, uh, basically a self-driving nail. It's a little hammer inside that, that, that um, hammers on the ground and then, then the hammer pulls itself down and pulls a tether behind it with temperature sensors on it, which can be used to measure heat flow. Um, it excited uh, 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 the, the comic, uh, the oatmeal in advance. He had this great uh, vision of a robotic mole conquering the planet. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, space is hard, as many people have said uh, before me. Um, we, uh, when, when the mole was first released, it went down about 30 or so centimeters, which got it mostly on underground, but then it stopped. So we pulled the support structure off the top to try to see what we could do. We tried to push down on the ground to give it enough friction to go farther down, and it promptly responded to that by backing out. Um, it was uh, a very uh, depressing image to wake up to when I lo downloaded the most recent images and said, oh, no, it went the wrong direction. Um, and so our, our engineers did a wonderful job of coming up with alternative ways to start getting it down. I think somewhere on the Internet, somebody said um, NASA scientists decide to hit themselves over the head with a shovel or something like that. Um, uh, so, you know, basically push down on the top and then let the, the mole hammer and get itself down and put it in, a, we put it in at a little angle and got it a little bit farther down and eventually then um, uh, uh, scooped some dirt over it and pressed down again to see if we can make it get farther. Um, unfortunately, that was the end. Um, it still did not make progress. We believe that the reason why is that the top 10 centimeters or so um, had a little bit more cohesion than we expected. And whenever it would be hammering, it would open up a little pit around it that it would no longer have enough um, uh, friction to keep continuing down. Um, but it is now completely buried and can make some, uh, some thermal conductivity measurements, which are being used to think about science still. Um, you may have heard uh, that I, I, there actually were stories last spring that uh, claimed that um, we'd gone into some super secret hibernation mode and were already dead because of energy concerns. Those were, of course, not true. We are actually continuing to get data continuously, even through conjunction. Um, but there was reality to it. Um, this is images of our solar panels more recently, and you can see they're much more dusty than that first image. We're now getting somewhere around 20% of the solar panel input that we got at the beginning of the mission. Um, and uh, as of the spring, we were very concerned that we were gonna have to shut down all the instruments during aphelion when the, the, our energy production is at a minimum and our thermal needs were at a maximum. Um, and so we had thought we were gonna have to shut down through aphelion and not turn on again until after conjunction. So towards the end of this month, um, but we actually found a way to get a little more energy. Um, uh, there was uh, some uh, of the geologists and atmospheric scientists in the group um, uh, were convinced that saltating part sand-sized particles could knock off dust grains. Um, and so the idea was that if we dump uh, sand-sized particles on the deck during a high wind, some of those sand-sized particles will get carried across 
the solar panel and kick off dust. And sure enough, we tried that four times and we got a total of about a, a, a close to 10% increase um, in our energy uh, production due to these cleaning uh, effects. And that was enough to let us keep operating through aphelion um, and conjunction. <clears throat> and um, that's been great. Um, this is very preliminary uh, data, but these are uh, three actually very significant events that happened in the last month. There's, I'm just, there's actually been others, but um, um, in particular, these 976A and 1000A were both with very large low frequency events that appear to be very far away. Um, 135 to 140 degrees distance that puts us kind of in the, the Tharsis region of Mars per chance. Um, we don't have good azimuths on these, so it's hard to say for sure exactly where they are. Um, but uh, these are uh, likely the largest events we've recorded um, uh, uh, over magnitude four. Um, and there's a lot of work being done on these. Uh, and we hope that they, these will give us more information on the very deep structure of Mars. Um, very preliminary though, since these have all just happened in the last few weeks. Um, so summarizing insight portion of the talk, um, it's, a, it's hard <laughs> to do seismometers on Mars compared to Earth, um, but uh, we've really done some, uh, been able to do some things. And one of the reasons why is that our seismic installation is quieter than any Earth installation because anywhere on Earth you always hear the oceans. And of course we don't hear those on Mars. Um, and uh, um, so that's some of the challenges we had to deal with. Um, changing gears, uh, more recently, I've been very uh, excited to start thinking about size, uh, seismic uh, work on the moon um, because uh, a, a couple months ago, uh, we were selected to fly on uh, one of the commercial landers um, and through the PRISM program to put uh, seismometers on the far side of the moon in Schrodinger Crater. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about this in more detail, but this is our, our, our far side seismic suite sitting on the deck of a fictional lander. We don't know what lander we'll actually be flying on. Um, and uh, so this is the one slide summary of everything we'd wanna do um, with the far side seismic suite. Um, the key is the, the, the instrument stays on the deck of the lander and continues operating after the lander stops functioning. The lander does not likely survive through the night, but we will survive at least four months um, and, and continually record data both day and night on the moon. Um, and it's the first time a seismometer has been on the far side of the moon and the most sensitive seismometer ever to be on the moon. Um, and I'm sorry if you're hearing cat sounds. My cat has decided he wants to talk to me during the, the meeting, but uh, there you go. Um, uh, so one of the interesting things is the Apollo seismometers were all on the near side and um, all of the seismicity recorded effectively was on the near side. So this is the first chance to see um, uh, quakes on the far side and start answering the question of whether the, the, the lack of observed far side seismicity was due to less seismicity on the far side or whether it was due to deep structure in the moon. Um, and also, uh, uh, you know, regardless of those details, there's reason to think there could be differences between the near side and the far side. And of course, we'll also look at local structure in Schrodinger Crater, which is a fascinating place. And by looking at the background noise, we should get information on micrometeorite impact rate. Um, just to put this in perspective, um, seismology on the moon is much different than seismology on Earth or even Mars. Um, these top two plots are uh, an earthquake recorded on Earth and a moon quake reported by, uh, recorded by Apollo 12, both on the same time scale, one hour. Um, and you can see a, an earthquake on this time scale looks almost like a single peak. There are actually several peaks in here. There's a P arrival and an S arrival in surface waves. Um, uh, but the moon quake on that same time scale just oscillates forever and ever and ever. Uh, over an hour, um, some of the largest impacts from Saturn 4B stages could go several hours. Um, uh, and, and this is because the moon is a very seismically scattering place. It's dry and broken up. And that's a perfect recipe for scattering seismic energy. So every event just bounces energy off of all those fractures and you can see it ringing for a very long time. Um, the other limitation of the Apollo data is that the digitization was necessarily very coarse using 60s technology. 
Um, and so uh, it was digitized at seven bits, whereas modern instruments are digitized at 24 bits. And the noise floor is limited by that digitization. So the smallest moon quakes look more like barcodes than, than, than quakes um, because they're just bouncing up and down by one or two bits. Um, far side seismicity, uh, what I was talking about. So these, uh, all the circles here are all the deep moon quakes. Um, whereas all the, the stars are shallow moonquakes and the orange box is outlining the near sides. You can see almost everything's on the near side with the exception of a few um, uh, deep moonquake clusters just on the other, uh, just around the limb. Um, and so uh, if we can use uh, far side events to understand the difference in far side seismicity. And if we can record any of these near side events, it'll give us information on the deep mantle of the moon. Um, Schrodinger Crater is beautiful and we'd like to learn more about it. There's interesting dynamics there. It's an impact melt floored crater, a very clear peak ring structure. Um, and we'll try to use similar approaches to what we used for Mars to look at the, the, the shallow structure there. Um, the instrument, which I'll talk about in a minute, is um, three to 30 times more uh, sensitive than the Apollo instruments, which were actually incredible, incredibly good instruments. Um, but we'll, we'll be able to push that noise floor down farther. The Apollo instruments never measured the actual noise floor of the moon. Um, we believe the noise floor should be governed by micrometeorite impact rates. So if we can constrain that, we can start putting more direct constraints on micrometeorite impact rates, which of course of interest to human exploration. Um, the first question people ask in this setting, um, when, now they've accepted we can do science with a single station, um, but then they say, well, why did you go through so much effort to get on the surface of Mars and then say that we can get away without doing that on the moon? Um, and the short answer is that the, the reason why it's so terrible on Mars is because the lander blows in the wind and there's no wind on the moon. That's not to say there won't be noise sources that were well coupled in with the lander. Um, uh, but uh, there certainly, certainly will be thermal noise and that'll be a very pronounced near dusk and dawn and probably somewhat less pronounced but noticeable during the day. But during the night, we should be very uh, thermally stable and should see some very good data. Um, and data can couple through a lander structure, no problem. We tested this on Earth by sticking a seismometer on top of the Curiosity engineering model and below it and uh, let them record for a weekend. And they recorded more or less identical information of all the earthquakes that, that you could see over a weekend in Pasadena. Um, most of these are far away and you wouldn't have felt them, but the, the instruments can see them just fine. Um, the two seismometers, we have a, a vertical component VBB seismometer, which is actually using flight spare from the InSight mission um, and just rotating it so that it's measuring just vertical component instead of a tilted uh, component that's able to measure three directions. We're only measuring one direction um, to reduce the total size and budget of the, of the mission. Um, and to accommodate for the different gravity, we have to swap out springs, but it's a minor change. Um, uh, and this is delivered by CNES, the French Space Agency, in cooperation with um, uh, uh, Institut de Physique du Globe de Paris. Um, uh, and uh, we also have a, a short period seismometer that's based on the same design as Insight. It's, it's um, a new build uh, because we have to change some spring constants for the different gravity and that requires machining a new one. Um, this is machined from a silicon die. It's a uh, what you call it, what they call a MIM system, um, and you just uh, machine out the uh, the proof mass in the spring from a silicon die, and then encase it in a nice magnet, uh, and and we and that's uh, the sensor, and this is being delivered by Kinemetrics, um, a, a, a U.S. based um, seismometer and and data logger company, um, and collaboration with Oxford and Imperial College London. Um, we're sitting in a design that's designed to keep us pretty toasty during the night. We'll stay pretty close to room temperature during the night um, using just the heat from running the seismometer. That's run, running the seismic system and, and uh, the electronics need to support it. Use about five watts of power and that gives us, that dissipation gives us more enough heat to stay uh, happy by uh, some innovative thermal design features, um, some uh, uh, multi-layer insulation and other things. Um, and during the day, we radiate heat out to this radiator on the top, the solar panels on the front because we're pretty far south. And so the, the sun never gets very far above the horizon. And so that gives us enough um, 
power and you know i just this is basically a cube set without propulsion because we have our own independent comms and power um and uh command and data handling it's all done um and and the system and uh most of that software is inherited actually from marco um which was a cube set that flew along with insight and, and uh sent our edl data back and this is supplied by uh our, our partners at the university of michigan um, who were involved in um, the design for Marco. Um, I've talked fast today. I shortened my talk because I wanted to leave time for questions and I realized I'm, I'm almost at the end and I, I, I could have uh, cut out a few less slides, but I, maybe I'm talking too fast. So if so, I apologize. But um, one interesting thing I kind of wanted to bring out, which is, um, you know, I think of interest to the lunar science community, um, is that the flight we are going on to the far side of the moon is called PRISM 1B. Um, and uh, the, you, we're not the only instrument suite on board. The far side seismic suite is not the only instrument on board. There's also um, from SWERI, uh, Bob Grimm as the PI for Litmus, which is a combination of the magnetotelluric measuring system he's been working on for a while and um, the heat flow probe that's um, being led by uh, Seiichi Nagahara at uh, Texas Tech. And so um, th there'll be electromagnetic measurements. Lucy is a, a, a package aimed at doing more astrophysical um, and heliophysical uh, um, uh, electromagnetic measurements. Um, and But regardless, this is a, a, a pretty capable geophysics suite flying on one lander, heat flow, Mag electromagnetic sensing and seismic sensing all on one lander and more or less this is the instrument instrumentation proposed um, in the planetary mission concept study for the lunar geophysical network which was sum submitted in the whole uh, decadal survey process which we will see the results of uh, in the next I don't know six months or so um, so you know, I, I just, you know, I, I, I mentioned that this is a kind of a test node. Um, obviously, we've, we've argued that there's a lot of science goals we'll reach with a single station. Um, but uh, I think this is an excellent, excellent test to start demonstrating what can be done if we expand it out to a network. Um, it's, it's certainly um, a lot of our events are going to be tough to locate, and we'll be making our best guess. Uh, with a networked location, we will be able to locate orders of magnitude more events, um, uh, and we'll be able to do uh, better measurements than we're able to do with this uh, compact sort of system that we've that we've uh, proposed for far side seismic suite. Um, and uh, so, we just think that uh, this can be a real key pathfinder. Um, looking at trade-offs of an undeployed seismic package um, and some demonstration of some possible instrumentation that could go um, and uh, and some of the thermal technologies may be able to uh, transition over for a long-lived uh, lunar geophysical network node as well. So just uh, to summarize of the second part of the talk, we, we, we will be outliving our commercial lander. So we are, we are uh, an independent package designed to live and operate through the lunar night. Um, and so this will be the first time operating on the far side of the moon, the most sensitive seismometer ever flown and um, demonstration of some pretty key technologies for long term light, uh, uh, operation on the moon. And uh, talk about some of the, the science goals there. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm really excited of, of, with the instruments we are co-manifested with, this, this opportunity to see what's possible with the Lunar Geophysical Network. And I'll stop there. Um, Sean, if you want to talk, I, I just, the, the questions just popped up right there towards the end. So yeah. um, uh, <laughs> I didn't get a chance to address them yet. No worries. Uh, uh, first, first off, I just want to note uh, that uh, that was a great talk, and uh, if you enjoyed the talk, please uh, t let Mark know in the chat. I know it's sometimes hard to get a sense for the audience appreciation in these virtual formats, so uh, please and please do that. Um, and if you have any questions, please be sure to put them in as well. Let's start with the first one. Um, the you made a comment that lunar seismology is very different than Earth seismology with unique challenges. Uh, what are the unique challenges? And uh, also, why is uh, Schrodinger Crater named that? 
Um, okay, so first unique challenge is, um, I, you know, the, the probably the key unique challenge compared to earth seismology is what I already mentioned. It's just a very scattered environment. And um, this, and, and it's even more scattering than, Mars is more scattering than the earth, but the moon is much more scattering than Mars. Um, and that's gonna um, make it even more challenging to locate events. Um, uh, we, we should be able to see PNS waves. The Apollo data demonstrated that very well. Um, but that extra step of looking for polarization to find locations is even more challenging when there's more scattering because what scattering does is ruin polarization. Um, uh, so it's gonna, that, that is the biggest challenge and, and one that we'll be thinking about all the time. And we're also thinking about other ways of looking for locations. So we'll be uh, uh, collaborating with telescopic observations that are looking for impact flash observations. Um, that would give timing and location of a known event if we could record it. Um, uh, we're talking with LRO for, for scanning for craters. Um, so that, that's, that's for uh, impact events. Um, uh, you know, if we're lucky enough to see uh, one of the shallow moonquakes, which can be quite large, those, those would be uh, really useful to see. And then actually we can work with, MR, uh, with LRO um, and see if uh, you could actually see indication of surface um, shaking. Um, there's been proposals that those quakes may be related to lobate scarp features. So if we have a, 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 an approximate distance, we can actually look around those lobate scarp features and see if we can find events. So there's a lot of interesting things to try to deal with those challenges, but it will be extremely challenging. And as far as um, what Schrodinger Crater was named after. I have no idea. Um, I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who knows more than I do about that. Um, so uh, I, I, I won't answer that question. I'd be totally making it up. <laughs> All right. Uh, Walter Kiefer asks, have any of the new seismic events at Insight included Rayleigh or other surface waves? Great question. And uh, the answer is still, unfortunately, no, we have not yet seen anything that looks like a surface wave and it's, and it drives me crazy. I spent uh, a lot of my pre-mission papers talking about all the wonderful things we were going to do with surface waves on Mars. And I was so wrong on everything, <laughs> which is uh, the fun part of planetary science, I suppose, um, uh, is, is making bold predictions and then being proven wrong, but still doing great <laughs> science anyway. Uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's what we aim to do. Um, there have been some interesting features. I, you know, just giving a hint on some of the things we're looking at now, there are actually some dispersed signals in one of the events we've seen in the last month that some people thought were surface waves. And then on, on closer look, we think that they're probably not, but they may be infrasound waves from an impact fingers crossed. Um, the, 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 nobody knows yet and we'll be looking through uh, uh, CTX images once conjunction is over and trying to figure out whether uh, that interpretation is supported. Um, but there, this, that's, that's not yet uh, published data, so there's more, more to be thinking about there. Elisa Gaddis asks, uh, Schrodinger was selected in part because of the interesting volcanics there. Are you studying those at all? Yeah, this is, uh, it's, a, it's a really great question. And, and um, one thing that made me think uh, they would um, have a hard time selecting us when we proposed for Schrodinger Crater, we assumed when they selected Schrodinger Crater that they were gonna select a lot of uh, instrument packages that were trying to sample the surface and, and, and say, you know, are, are we looking at impact melt or swayvite or what, you know, whatever, uh, whatever sort of process is there. Um, uh, the short answer is we'll be looking, um, like I said, we'll be trying to look for the shallow layered structure. Um, and there are some, you know, some velocity differences that we, we might be looking for. Um, uh, uh, I, I, I did quite a bit of talking last week with Sean Gulick, um, uh, thinking about uh, what sorts of velocity signals we may see um, on a crater like that when you compare with, say, Chicxulub crater on Earth. Um, and there are some velocity signals we might look for um, related to the peak ring structure and, and the melts. Um, uh, so we'll be trying to do that, but certainly not in any direct way like you would get at with a sampling mission. Um, I'm excited that they went for a geophysically focused mission, but I'll admit I was somewhat surprised that they, they went for that. Um, but I'm, for me, pleasantly surprised. <laughs> 
Uh, Pat McGovern says, uh, has a, I have a question about those focal mechanisms. I'm not sure if you wanted to expand on that uh, right now, Pat, or uh, ask it later. Oh, uh, since the miracle technology, I can appear right here in a little box. There yes, there you are. <laughs> uh, with, with the moon behind me. Um, yeah, Mark, uh, 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 great stuff. I wanted, I wondered if you could put up the, um, the map with, uh, the, with the focal mechanisms on it and Cerberus Fosse. Getting there, getting there. <laughs> I probably should have zoomed out. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, um, I, well, you know, I, I wonder just how well constrained the focal mechanisms are given you've got one station because I, I well, I mean, the, the one on the right, the lower right looks, uh, you know, that's a mixed uh, normal strike slip uh, situation. And that's, you know, what you might expect yeah. going on there. The other one, and that's like a, almost a de Colmont fault if it's, you know, the, the, the ambiguity of those things, it's, it can, it, you can have two fault planes in, in each of those and that one, it's yeah. either horizontal or vertical. And horizontal doesn't make any sense because it's not like there's a detachment or anything going on there. But the alternative is, is, is vertical and, you know, that's like, okay, well, it's a tension crack, but that's not an actual, you know, failure surface. That's just two things going out of contact. Yeah, fair enough, and that's a that's a that's a good point. Um, it, so uh, the short answer is that um, you know you can see the uncertainties given the methodological choices here. So there, there, you know, th these are actually clouds, um, mm -hmm. but that's of course not the true reflection of the uncertainty. Um, there, there were you know there it doesn't explore the un uncertainties related to the velocity model, which are non negligible. Um, we did, exp they, uh, well, this is Ninka Brinkman did this work. I shouldn't say we, um, uh, the, the joy of being a project scientist is I get to present everybody else's results. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, you know, there, she did quite a bit of testing of, of depth dependence and these were pretty stable with uh, across a pretty wide depth range. Um, but certainly you can perturb these some and you can see that, you know, even uh, with you know, for the more distant event, the 183A, um, you know, it's not well constrained at all. Um, so um, I, I'm sure you could argue that the dip may not be as well constrained as indicated here. So it may be a more real, a more normal, normal fault, if you will, um, and, 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 and be dipping uh, more shallowly than just a vertical one. Um, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, the interesting thing is, of course, that the the, the Grobbins themselves are extremely steep sided, so um, you know there may be at least near surface they may be pretty close to vertical faults. Although I'm sure they the dip would change with depth. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Pat. John uh, Bilden asked, I may have missed this part of the presentation, but are there any seismic events, Mars or Moon, that you can directly attribute to meteorite impact? And if so, how do you differentiate the two? On the moon, there are many uh, meteorite impacts. Um, I'm not sure the exact numbers, but hundreds. <laughs> um, uh, uh, hundreds of meteorite impacts on, on, the, on the moon and, and even several artificial impacts because the upper uh, Saturn 4B stages were uh, crashed into the moon and, and recorded by the earlier uh, stations. So um, th there's a lot of information on that. They do look different. There are differences in frequency content, difference in relative amplitude of PNS waves. Um, on Mars, however, um, at this point, we have not yet convinced ourselves that we've seen any impact events. There was one um, uh, CTX observed impact very near the beginning of the mission that was within 100 kilometers or so, but it was, uh, the crater was um, right at the borderline of what could be resolved with CTX, a um, few meters maybe. Um, and uh, our, to our best guess, it was right at the borderline of whether we could observe it or not. Um, and we couldn't find it in the data. Um, so um, the short answer is we don't know how uh, different impacts will look on Mars because we haven't, we don't have real data to compare it with. I can, I can talk on how they're different on the moon, um, but there's gonna be, you know, what we know from the moon doesn't necessarily carry directly over to Mars. Um, as I said, in one of the recent events, there's a hint that it may be an impact. And so I, I may be able to tell you more um, in the near future on that answer than I can tell you now, but um, that's all very preliminary. And, and we also may find out that, that that feature that may be infrasound waves from an impact may also just be instrumental noise that we don't yet under, understand. So this, this is the joy. We have to convince ourselves of it and we haven't got there yet. So that's why it's not 
a, a submitted paper at this point. But um, no, there's there's no event that we've clearly identified as an impact on Mars yet. Cool. Uh, Carol Kendall asks: Is the core of Mars liquid, or is it, and or is any of it solid? Um, I could say the transition from core to mantle, um, it, the core is definitely liquid at that point. Um, the ob so that was already suggested by tidal measurements before we got there. Um, that, that, uh, that, was, that was believed that it was likely uh, liquid. Um, the radio science measurements uh, al also confirmed that. The seismic measurements, the reason why we can say that is that in order for us to see SCS like we saw, um, it has to be a liquid core because if it were a solid core, um, the reflection coefficient would have been much smaller and we wouldn't have seen an SES of that size. Um, so uh, we're quite confident that the initial contrast um, goes from uh, to a liquid core. Um, and then when you add in the extra constraint that in order to have a core as big as we're seeing there, you have to have a lot of light elements in there. It can't be very close to a pure iron nickel core. Um, it's likely that um, uh, with that much light element in there, it's really difficult to solidify any core. Um, so there's probably not a solid inner core like we have on Earth. Um, I, that's, but we don't have any direct observation that says that. Um, so we can't say for certain there's no inner core on Mars. Um, but uh, most likely, um, uh, the 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 the. The most likely uh, interpretation is that it's an entirely liquid core, um, which of course brings up interesting questions about why there's no magnetic field, um, uh, and which, which, and in other words, probably gives us some constraints on how much heat flow is coming out of the core, um, because uh, if there if there's not enough heat flow coming out of the core, you can't get the thermal convection that you need for a dynamo. Um, so, um, you know, the, I, I, there's a lot of interesting observations that flow out from that, that the, the, the magnetic modelers can have fun with. Cool. Apologies, I skipped a question. Um, can the probes detect and distinguish solar plasma slash electric events? Um, I'm not smart enough to answer that question. I'm sorry, the, the, the seismometers, I don't think there's much to be done on that, um, you know, as far as, um, what can be done with the, the various uh, electromagnetic sensors on, on the, the PRISM 1B mission. I'm sure there are things that can be done there, but um, that's not my field of expertise. So I'll, I'll, I'll avoid answering that question. All right. Um, and for Ellen uh, Jablinski, I apologize if I mispronounced your name, I asked, following on Lisa's question, has a landing site in Schrodinger been chosen? I'm curious if FSS will be near the large pyroclastic vent. Um, no, it has not. The specific landing site has not yet been selected. Um, there, the, um, the project scientist um, at NASA has been getting input from us. Um, I have said that I don't have any real strong concerns. I just want, I, I'd like to be in a relatively smooth area, makes it easier to, for, to interpret any layering we see. So, so not sitting right on top of the peak ring or anything like that. Um, uh, and uh, also, um, I'm, I just don't want uh, topographic shading of my solar panel or anything like that. <laughs> so uh, that, that's my concern. Uh, um, I, I know um, Seiichi and, and the heat flow probe team have, have opinions, but they, they are, are fairly agnostic. They can do interpretations from many different locations. But um, my guess is that the landing site will be settled on around the same time as the, vin the lander vendor will be selected. And um, to the best of my knowledge, that's going to be early next year. Fantastic. All right, it's just about four o'clock and I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat. So uh, I just want to thank you again, Mark, for your talk. Those are really fantastic talk, fantastic questions and uh, following that up. Um, so if you, yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, email, email us or email Mark. Um, the LPI virtual seminar we will not be happening next week. But the week after, our guest will be a do uh, Dr. Adine Denton of uh, Purdue University, who will be talking about her work on Pluto. So I hope to see you uh, in two weeks' time. Thanks, to everyone, for coming. Thanks. I'm Mark Scott. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's very needy. <laughs> yeah.